Okay. Um, great. So uh, this session is also being recorded, I should note, and the recorded version of this webinar will be available to all of the registrants um, in the future. So we will be sending out a separate link with information on how to access this recorded session. Additionally, in the control panel in front of you, you will be able to access the materials for this session. We have um, a few different uh, materials in the, uh, available. We have a frequently asked questions about uh, the webinar series. We also have uh, both Alex's presentation and a supplemental PDF with resources. Okay, so uh, at this point, I would like to introduce today's uh, instructor, and then I will transition over to Alex. So um, our instructor for today is Alex Crow. Alex holds a Bachelor's in Science in Recording Arts from Indiana University and an MLIS from the University of Illinois. Uh, he previously worked for May Mayheron Archival, which is an audio digitization vendor based out of Bloomington, Indiana. Additional previous experience includes his work at the Brown Media Archives and Peabody Awards as the audio and video preservation engineer, uh, which is at the University of Georgia. He is currently the digital archivist for the Brown Media Archives while continuing to oversee digitization efforts. He's also worked for the last decade as a freelance recording engineer in Bloomington, Indiana and Athens, Georgia. Uh, I will uh, now invite Alex to uh, join us. So Alex is on the line as well now. Welcome, Alex. Uh, thanks, Kim. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Looks like that's a yes. All right, welcome everybody, and thanks, Kim, for the introduction. Um, I'd like to also thank David Walker and Marco Suero Ball for helping put this webinar together, and also thank Amia for putting the series together. I think it addresses a real need, and uh, I'm I'm happy to be a part of it. And I have a lot to cover today, so I uh, apologize if I move quickly. Um, but in service of getting it all done, I might uh, might talk quickly at, at times. And if you ever find that I'm sort of uh, not explaining things as fully as you'd like, please feel free to um, say something in the chat window, and I will be watching that throughout. And I'll try to address questions as they arise. So uh, in last Thursday's webinar, Marcos talked about digital audio formats, and so this is the companion webinar where we talk about workflows. And um, as, as Kim mentioned in the introduction, I, I began my career as an audio engineer, and so I, I tend to think of things from a technical standpoint and from the point of view of the audio engineer in the archives. And it's not until more recently that I've really had to consider workflows more holistically as a digital archivist. Um, and so what I hope to communicate here today is that um, not just the technical aspects of migrating content from their original carriers, but I want to talk about all of the aspects of working with digital audio from ingest to access, so to speak. Let's see. Okay. Um, so just an overview here. I'll start talking about standards um, and best practices as they apply to digital audio in the archives and preservation world. And then I'm going to move into talking about equipment considerations quite a bit. Um, I've tried to include some insights here from the audio engineering world that may shed some light on how to properly set up and use equipment that I feel like doesn't really get addressed in the literature too much. And then we'll actually talk about the elements of an in-house workflow. And I'm imagining that many of you are here because you want to know what it takes to work uh, with born digital audio assets or because you're actively migrating and, and working with them currently. Uh, even if you plan on outsourcing a lot of your migration work to vendors, though, there's still a lot of work that happens before and after migration. So um, I think there's five sections, five elements of the workflow that I'll be talking about, and migration is just one of those. And within each section, I'll give an overview of the process, and then I'll also give examples of tools. 
And then at the very end, we'll touch briefly upon what's involved with sending out your assets to vendors if you're ever doing that. Okay, standards. Standards are, are basically uh, your homework. They kind of give us a general overview of a topic if it's new to you, but they can also give us very specific recommendations, um, and they should always be used as a reference, and, and they're helpful to keep nearby when you're um, sort of in the throes of a project. And I would say that standards and best practices are very useful for understanding how a process should maybe ideally work. Um, they represent a lot of hard work by knowledgeable people who have sort of been in, in your situation before. And to some extent, they represent a consensus of opinion about how best something should be done. Uh, but the reality of the work that we do in nonprofit institutions and archives is that we often only strive towards best practices and standards. And I'd just like to take a moment to say that that's OK. Because in the end, you just have to do uh, the best with the resources that you have. Um, but you should be able to justify maybe why you're doing something uh, a little bit different, why you're deviating from standards and best practices. So in this way, standards are kind of more like a compass as opposed to a map. And um, not to mention they're, they're really great for get, getting everybody doing roughly the same thing, um, which makes information sharing a little bit easier. So the big one in the digital preservation world is the OAIS reference model. Um, and this is a pretty high level model that doesn't really have anything to do with digital audio per se, but it does have everything to do with making digital information accessible in the long term to communities of people. And I think we can all agree that we're all in the business of doing that. And of course, once audio becomes digital, it essentially be becomes information. Um, and the OAIS reference model uh, tells us that there's more to it than just copying bits from, say, your archival original to your file-based preservation copy. Uh, and why do I say that? Because central to the OAIS reference model is the idea of an information package. And the concept of the information package itself makes it clear that um, we need to do more than just collect the content information. We also need to um, we need information about the digital object and information in service of the digital object in order to sufficiently preserve, describe, retrieve, and render it to our end users. So in other words, backup is not preservation. Uh, a question in chat, what does OAIS stand for? Yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, it stands for the uh, Open Archival Information Systems Reference Model. And it came out of the space data community, I suppose, if, if that's a community. Um, but they really distilled the essence of how to preserve and make accessible digital information. And so that's really been adopted in the digital preservation world as a high-level model for um, doing the same work with media. Yes, open archival information system. And there should be a link in, in the uh, references. Uh, to the Magenta book, which is um, the 2012 edition of that standard. Uh, so like I said, in the OAS reference model, um, there's this idea of the information package. And there's the, a few different kinds, and that's not really relevant to our conversation today. But um, in the definition of the information package, uh, the OAIS reference model wants us to actually include technical metadata, preservation metadata, packaging information, and descriptive information. So because a lot of this information is best extracted or generated or collected at different points throughout the migration process, uh, I'm going to talk about when and how that might happen. So from the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives comes two pretty well-known uh, documents, IAZA TCO3 and TCO4. I think they're probably the best known in the uh, moving image and uh, audiovisual archives world. Um, if you don't have these on hand, you should. 
TCO3 is really the go-to reference document for doing audio preservation. And it includes information that is specific to digital carriers, so it's not just useful for analog to digital conversion. And when I was looking at it recently, a couple quotations jumped out at me. The first one, uh, due to the high density of information, digital carriers are generally more vulnerable to loss of information through damage than analog carriers. And that one jumped out at me because I think there's kind of this misconception uh, that's prevalent that digital is safer. And, uh, well, as many of us know, nothing can be further from the truth. And the second quotation, all specific digital audio formats have become obsolete after a short period in the market. So we're not talking about them becoming obsolete in the future. They've already become obsolete. And um, that fact in particular really drives a lot of the preservation work that we do with digital audio. And IATA TCO4 um, is more specific to the post-digitization or post-migration process. So it covers the same ground that the OAIS reference model does, and it also includes terminology from the OAIS. So the Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative has released a number of useful uh, documents. And the first one I'm mentioning here is the Digitization Activities Project Planning and Management Outline. Um, this also isn't uh, specific to digital audio, but it is, the scope of the document is the same as this presentation. So in terms of the elements of a workflow, it kind of covers the same ground. And it's especially useful to uh, look at this through the lens of uh, project management. And um, so, so anyways, that's why that, that document is highlighted here. Um, and But then other things that FADGI has released, like the Broadcast Wave Metadata Embedding Guidelines are um, you know, very specific to digital audio. And that one in particular informs the how and why to uh, embed metadata in the Broadcast Wave header. And that document actually includes a lot of use cases that you probably won't use, um, so keep that in mind. But, you know, you don't have to do everything that they recommend in there. But um, there are some very useful things that you can do, and I'll highlight one uh, particular use case uh, later on in this webinar. And speaking of standards and best practices, if you didn't see the presentation on digital audio formats, the broadcast WAV file format is um, widely used as the preservation format for audio because it supports linear PCM audio, which is uncompressed audio, and because it also supports this embedding of metadata. And then the last thing I've highlighted here is um, the NARES recommendations for delivery of recorded music projects. Now this is the same organization that uh, is responsible for the Grammys, and uh, this is by no means required reading, but I just thought it was interesting because it demonstrates that the recording industry has the need for standards and best practices too, and so these don't always come from academia or nonprofit or governmental, governmental bodies. This one in particular has useful recommendations for making recorded music projects that come out of nonlinear editing applications like Pro Tools or Logic or Cubase or anything like that. Um, recommendations for sort of finalizing them and making them more interoperable. And so that has some useful concepts for the preservation world as well. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit and, and talk about equipment. For the time being, the equipment that I'm referring to here, this is equipment that, that plays digital audio on a physical carrier, so like a DAT tape or a mini disc. In other words, we're not talking about files on a hard drive for the time being. Um, so uh, professional audio equipment as opposed to computer or IT equipment. And the concepts here are directly related to the operation of the equipment that you'll be using to do migration. So, you know, there's really practical implications for you if you're thinking about uh, setting up a migration chain and you need to know what equipment to buy. You also need to know about these concepts because if you uh, get some of this stuff wrong, uh, you might unnecessarily degrade the quality of your audio through unnecessary uh, conversion, uh, like analog to digital or digital to analog conversion, or you might 
irreversibly propagate playback errors into your preservation and access files. So let's talk about error correction and concealment. This is a feature that all digital audio machines incorporate into their playback mechanisms. So uh, data from digital carriers can sometimes be unrecoverable due to imperfections with the recording medium, like say there's a crinkle in the tape or there's dust on the surface of an optical disc. When these playback machines encounter these imperfections, they won't necessarily be able to recover all of the data that's there. And because of that, they've been designed to incorporate uh, error correction and, and concealment methods. And there's a few different ones that I've listed here. Like for instance, interpolation, when it, when it encounters bad data, it can actually um, choose a value that makes sense depending on the surrounding data and use that data in place of the unrecoverable data. Or uh, in the case of muting, if, if there's such an egregious error that it can't possibly interpolate or, or repeat the previous data or something, then it might just mute the output when it encounters errors. And I've included an example of that because I've uh, encountered it quite a lot frequently. Um, and so this is an example of playing back a DA78, which is a multi-track uh, digital audio format. And on the screen is a representation of the waveforms from each track, and, and this is in Pro Tools. And wherever you see an orange arrow, you'll also notice there's um, just a, a block of missing uh, waveform data right there. And that's an example of muting. And those, those sections are actually pretty significant. I mean, it, I think it, those could even be like a full second in length. So that's a pretty big, it's a pretty big dropout. Kim, I seem to have lost control. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Okay, and uh, this is an example. I don't know if this error here that you see on the screen on the top two lines, uh, that's not muting. Um, it's something different. But basically what that sounds like is a blast of white noise. And um, what I'm trying to demonstrate here with this illustration is that on the top two tracks, this segment of audio was played from a DAT tape. And on the bottom two tracks, that same segment was played on the same tape, but in a different machine. And you'll notice that that error um, is no longer there. And basically what this demonstrates is that uh, different machines interact with the media differently. And that um, they d the errors don't always remain persistent sometimes. So you should be familiar with what errors sound and look like. And, you know, if you encounter them, there's sort of a couple different ways you can try to get around them. You can either play it back in the same machine again, and if that doesn't work, try playing it in a different machine. And that, that could be the difference between playing a tape with errors and, and playing it back without errors. Um, the other thing you, you should consider uh, is that when, when you start to see an increase in errors in a playback machine, that could also be an indication of the machine's health. As playback hours start to add up, the um, heads and the alignment of the tape against the head can actually, um, you know, it starts to wear down. And then recovery is a little bit less precise, and so you might see more errors. And that just can tell you that you need to have your machine serviced. Uh, another thing you'll likely encounter um, working with digital audio equipment is that there's a slew of interconnect standards. And there's even more than what I'm showing right here, but these are the ones that are most common, I think, and they're also the ones that I could just take a picture of because they're on my machines here. Um, it's important to understand what you're going to be working with because it can be tempting to just plug in whatever cable fits and then just call it a day. But 
each one, at least uh, a few of these require a very specific type of cable. And it's probably not the one you already have. And to complicate things further, uh, different interconnect standards can use the same form factor as we'll see with the TOSLINK ADAT interconnect. So AES-EBU, um, or AES-3, often just shorthand called AES, um, and SPDIF, these two are by far the most common. And they're based on the AES-3 standard, which was developed jointly by the Audio Engineering Society and the European Broadcasting Union in 1985. And the, the basics of the standard is this. It can transmit two channels of PCM audio in one direction on one cable at um, basically any sample rate. And then SPDIF, or S slash PDIF, is the consumer version of AES-3. Um, and I, uh, consumer version should be in quotations here. I mean, it's, it's, some people refer to it that way, but it's also very common to find it on professional equipment. Um, it utilizes a lower signal voltage and it's on an unbalanced line, which just means that it's prone to more noise induction and electromagnetic interference compared to AES-3. But it is still a, a professional standard that's used. And each one of these connections has a sort of doppelganger cable that you should avoid using. So for AES-3, an XLR cable will fit but you should really be using a proper AES-3 cable, which has a specified 110 ohm nominal impedance. Um, an XLR cable will probably work, but you're introducing an unnecessary risk by using a cable of unspecified impedance. And then with the uh, SPDIF, you could, you could just plug in like your regular AV RCA cable, but uh, you shouldn't. You should find a cable that's specifically uh, used for connecting SPDIF, which is a 75 ohm shielded coaxial cable with an RCA connector. And when you have the choice between these two, they often appear on the same machines. Um, AES-3 is more robust, so I would probably use that. But if you only have SPDIF, don't sweat it. It should be totally fine to use as long as you have the correct cable and you keep it to a short length. So the TOSLINK standard, which is short for Toshiba Link, is actually another version of the AES specification. And it's often called optical SPDIF because it uses a fiber optic cable. Uh, but this connection is also used in the ADAT optical interface standard, which was originally developed by Alesis for their ADAT recording decks. And um, those were capable of recording eight tracks on an SVHS tape. And so the standard allowed for eight channels of uh, 44.1 or 48K audio to be transmitted on one cable. And then there's this other technology called sample multiplexing. Um, this is utilized by certain manufacturers to allow higher sample rates at the cost of transmittable channels. So for instance, some interfaces equipped with sample multiplexing could transmit four channels of 96K or two channels of 192K using the, the ADAT fiber optic uh, interconnection standard. And then the last one here is the TDIF format, which was developed by TASCAM for uh, their multi-track digital audio tape recorders. The DA78 and DA88 are examples of those. So there's some other ones I haven't listed here, like MADI um, or SDIF2. Um, you may or may not encounter these. They're not super common, or they're, they're maybe just not common in uh, the archives world. But the point is to make sure that you know what standard you'll be using with a particular piece of playback equipment. And then you also need to make sure that that interconnection is available on your audio interface to your computer. And then be sure to use the correct cable, not just the one that uh, fits. Okay, let's talk about clocking for a second. Uh, this is something that's pretty easy to overlook in the digital audio world if you're not familiar with the concept. But the basic idea is this. In all digital audio systems, timing is really critical to the accuracy of the system. It's used during 
analog to digital conversion in recording and digital analog conversion for playback. And for each of these, the timing must be really stable and accurate in order for it to be of a high quality. And so to accomplish this, digital audio devices either rely on their internal clock, so that's like an actual circuit inside, their, in, inside the machine, or an external clock, which is a separate piece of equipment, or a clock source from a separate piece of equipment. And so what this means for you as the operator is that you have to make a choice with each piece of playback or interface equipment that you're using, whether or not to use the internal clock source or synchronize to an external clock source. Uh, additionally, when you have multiple machines that need to work together, they all should be using the same clock. This is kind of like if you picture a band um, and everybody is uh, using their sort of internal timing to play music together, you know, that all might work okay, but as soon as you introduce a metronome into the equation and everybody's listening to the metronome, then you know everything is using the same time base and is timing everything exactly the same. Oh, let me go back for a second. I want to mention, too, that uh, if you get clocking wrong, you'll actually be introducing audible errors into your, your signal. And this is, um, this kind of sounds like a low-level crackling or numerous little pops, and it's kind of hard to describe because it doesn't sound like anything else. It just sounds like clocking errors. And this is also called jitter. And um, you can hear what it sounds like. I meant to include this in the resources, but I think I can just paste it in the chat window here. There's something called the, oh wait, um, let's see. Okay, the Audiovisual Artifact Atlas is an online resource that allows you to sort of see and hear examples of errors uh, that occur, and there's a lot of different ones. Um, but this is the link to Jitter if you want to hear what it sounds like. So let's just look at a simple clocking setup. This is just a two-channel migration workflow. Um, you're going to have a deck and you're going to have a computer interface. And the easiest way to ensure proper clocking is to slave the interface or sync the interface to the incoming audio. Um, the reason you can do this is because the AES specification includes the clock signal with the audio signal. So if you look on the um, control panel of my interface on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see in the middle, under Preferred Sync Reference, I've, got, I've chosen AES. So that means the clock of my interface is um, synchronizing to the incoming AES signal. Um, so that's kind of just the easiest way to do it. You don't have to have a separate clock uh, device in this situation. But let's say you have um, multiple playback decks. In this situation, you would have an external clock, uh, just a standalone device, and it would be sending a clock signal actually connected by a coaxial cable with a BNC connector normally to each individual playback deck. And so that's sending the clock signal to each deck. And then on each deck, you would sync to the external clock source. And at the same time, you have a separate cable that's transmitting either AES or ADAT or TDIF or whatever uh, going to the interface. And now if we look again, at the um, control panel on the right-hand side. In the middle, I'm no longer syncing to AES, I'm now syncing to word clock. So if that's not completely clear to you, um, just remember that you need to um, basically just make that decision at some point and, and um, do it until you don't hear jitter is basically the way you do it correctly. <laughs> um, but following these recommendations, uh, should should get you there. Okay, I want to talk briefly about the differences between analog to digital converters and audio interfaces. 
Uh, each one of these, these are two fundamentally different things, but many times they're in the same piece of equipment. But put simply, one converts from analog to digital, and then the other acts as an interface to your digital audio workstation or computer. And if you're planning a setup that's purpose-built for doing digital audio migration, you don't need an analog to digital converter. All you need is the interface that allows you to route your digital audio signal from your playback machine into the computer by way of, you know, FireWire, USB, or PCIe. So this is important to keep in mind because, like I said, they're often together in the same box, and um, conversion is really expensive. A good analog to digital converter can easily run you $1,000 per channel, but why pay for that when there are budget-minded interfaces that are perfectly adequate for transferring a digital signal? Um, and I also bring it up because there's a lot of talk in the audio preservation world about what's the best converter, and people go to great lengths to try and quantify or endorse a specific one for preservation purposes. And that's because depending on the build quality and the components used, you could have very transparent analog to digital conversion. And there's generally this correlation between how expensive a piece of equipment is and how well it performs. Of course, that's not true in all cases. But, you know, a $200 converter probably isn't as good as a $2,000 converter. But in digital audio setups, you kind of get to bypass this altogether because as long as the interface can reliably transmit a digital signal, there's no qualitative or even quantitative difference between what one interface will do versus the other. It's just transferring data. So the only thing you really care about is that you can actually connect the two pieces of equipment and that your um, interface isn't introducing any errors to the digital information. Okay, so let's shift gears again and, and actually start talking about uh, migration workflows. The elements I've listed here are pretty logical, discrete activities that all happen in response to a migration project. And I'll talk generally about what's involved and give an overview, and then I'll actually give examples of tools that you can use to get the job done. Uh, but first, before we begin migrating, uh, let's have a quick reality check, because as archivists and curators, we're used to thinking about these sorts of things, these questions here on the screen, but it can be tempting to get a new setup kind of up and running and just throw anything and everything at it in order to uh, make a dent in the mountain of work that you have to do. But especially with digital audio, prioritization is really important. And so the first question, should it be migrated? Well we know that all digital audio carriers are obsolete. And uh, before very long, we won't be able to play them back. So, you know, it seems like, of course, we should migrate it. Um, but I think this really makes it even more important to assess the content and its potential research value, because maybe you won't get to everything. And then, of course, copyright issues are the same uh, for digital audio. It's just um, a different format. And then, can it be reasonably migrated? And you know, this is when you should be honest with yourself. Do you have the resources to do it? Or will somebody else maybe have the resources to do it? Will you maybe just let content waste away on a hard drive on a shelf until the, until the drive fails? You know, these are things that you uh, should be considering. Okay, the things that you do before you start migrating digital assets don't really differ too much from conventional digitization projects. You still need to assign unique identifiers to your physical objects. Um, but if you're dealing with hard drives, if you're dealing with digital audio as files on a hard drive, um, you'll have to go in and sort of identify discrete sets of files to deal with and treat those as uh, digital objects or you know, one sort of management unit. Um, and then you can think of those as sort of on the item level. Or you may decide that your hard drive is the item, and then you'll want to deal with its contents in aggregate. In terms of transcribing and capturing metadata, of course, you still want to um, copy all the metadata from any housing or any associated documents that you have. But with digital files, your housing could actually be 
the file names themselves. And so if you plan on changing them according to a file naming convention, then of course you'll want to record the original file names. And you'll still want to supplement with additional administrative cataloging and especially do whatever you need to do to be able to tie the digital file back to the original object. And before you start migrating, you should have a file naming convention or um, at least a, like a folder naming convention or a, an object naming convention, something that allows you uh, to know what you're going to call that thing once it's in the digital world. And I like doing file names based on a unique object identifier. So the corresponding digital file will be based on uh, the original physical object. I know others like to use machine assigned identifiers. Um, really it's whatever works for you. And the thing to consider though is that file names are really a convenience for humans. Um, and so they can help you manage files as, as they move throughout the sort of creation uh, and curation life cycle really. And it can be difficult to visually identify machine um, assigned identifiers and maybe misidentify or mistakenly select the wrong file if it's a, a random string of numbers or letters. But really that's up to you and whatever works for you is, is you know, what works. But just keep in mind if you change the original file names for administrative purposes and management purposes, again, you have to have that original piece of information recorded somewhere before you do. And then, of course, when you're allocating disk space for a migration project, um, you're going to be doing this according to the source sample rates and bit depths because um, unlike, say, a preservation uh, digitization project where you're sort of normalizing everything to the same sample rate and bit depth, um, you'll have different, different values here. So it's not all going to be the same. So that can make uh, allocating disk space a little more challenging. And then if you do receive born digital files on a hard drive and they include checksums, then of course you'll want to validate that data to make sure that you have correct data to begin with. And if it's um, not correct, then you'll want to, you know, send them back to the producer or donor or whatever and try and get the correct data to begin with. And you'll also maybe want to be checking for viruses uh, so you don't compromise your whole system. So quickly, just um, talking about folder and file naming conventions. If you don't have one, of course, you're setting yourself up for a lot of headaches because without it, it's going to be really difficult to manage all of your digital objects. An easy to follow convention should really allow you to predict what your file names should be based off of some other piece of information, like an item identifier or an accession number. Um, instead of trying to find out what they are, based on, like, you have to go actually find the file first. If you know what it's called, that'll make it a lot easier. And as a bonus, file naming conventions can make your file names actionable algorithmically. So for instance, um, if the first element in your file name is a collection identifier, uh, it can be really easy to search or manage all of your files that have that collection identifier in the file name. But again, it's a convenience for you, and so um, you should do whatever works for you. But as a caveat, you should also never store information. Uh, let me rephrase that. You shouldn't use the file name to store information. It should be somewhere else, too. And then this other bit about um, the 10 rules in, for best practice of file naming is, is really uh, practical considerations about what, like not using special characters in the file name or, you know, don't use a colon, don't use a slash in the file name because doing so could prevent you from, um, it, it could break some applications that you're using down the line to actually curate those files and then you'll have to go back and spend a lot of time cleaning up file names. Okay, so let's talk about migration. At the most basic level, migration is all about ensuring the accurate transfer of bits. 
And for real-time transfers from tape-based media, it seems as simple as pressing record on the computer and hitting play on the playback equipment, but there are these other processes that um, happen concurrently in order to ensure the accurate transfer of those bits. So how will you quality control the processes? You should, of course, listen to the transfer, listen for errors, and uh, check for errors afterwards. What about quality assurance processes? Um, making sure that when you do find errors, have a procedural way of preventing them from happening again. So with physical carriers, uh, you're watching out for errors created by, um, like we talked about earlier, imperfections in the recording media and their interaction with the playback machine. Um, and of course, you must also make sure that your clocking is set up correctly and that everything is connected properly. And I would also say you want to make sure that your computer is optimized so that other processes aren't running in the background that might interrupt the uh, capture process. And with file-based media, it's important to know what processes as well can introduce errors or cause problems with your files. For instance, dragging files off of an audio CD in, um, in a Mac Finder or like Windows Explorer could copy over errors from the driver error concealment process. Also, dragging and dropping an entire hard drive's worth of files could produce incomplete file transfers. So, of course, um, as part of a quality control and assurance process, we're going to be using these tools to make sure that they either don't happen to begin with, these errors don't show up to begin with, or if they do show up, we have a way of catching them and correcting them ourselves or um, preventing them from happening in the future. So I've included this video here. Uh, I hope it plays back. And this is, uh, this is all about enabling error monitoring on your uh, playback machines. And so the link that I've included here shows you how to do that on, on a number of different digital audio devices. And so hopefully what this video, oh, I can't play it. What it would have shown you <laughs> is that um, the meters on the right, ooh, is that going to work? Okay, here we go. So the meters on the right, is, they're showing audio currently. And then I hit an unlikely combination of keys, uh, buttons, and now all of a sudden the, um, the meters are actually showing the, the errors that are occurring in the playback. And so you may think, wow, that's a lot of errors, but um, that's, that's just par for those machines. And uh, what you end up doing is getting, uh, getting an idea of what's normal, what's your sort of baseline. And then as you start to see those errors rise, you, you then know that you have uh, to intervene in some way. I'm actually going to skip ahead here for a second and talk about um, audio CDs and how you might deal with those. CD audio, the standard itself, has a number of correction and concealment methods built in that makes playback extremely robust. And in fact, it's so good that you're probably listening to errors all the time and not even knowing it. And on the one hand, it seems like, oh, well, that's okay. You can't tell. But um, you know, there's a better way here, and it's this program called Exact Audio Copy. It's been around for a little while, and it has these features built in that make it a lot more reliable for accurately retrieving audio from CDs. So, for instance, uh, when it reads bad sectors of data, it will reread those sectors until it retrieves error-free data. And uh, if it can't retrieve that data, then it will actually report that to you. Um, I don't really know of any other way short of hooking up uh, machines to the sort of um, circuit boards of CD players to actually read those error flags, but uh, this program, you know, does a perfectly adequate job of doing, of doing that for you and, and reporting errors and preventing them. So, um, like I said, it, it has all these features built in, but it's really as simple to use as, you know, importing CDs from using iTunes or something like that. Uh, but unfortunately, it's only available for Windows. <laughs>
And then there's this other situation when you're trying to migrate CDs where maybe it might be important to retain uh, the behavior of an audio CD. You know, there are these sort of quirky behaviors like there's audio in gaps and someone might consider that really important to the experience of the CD. Or maybe it's an enhanced audio CD and if you were to just copy over the audio files, you would be missing out on everything else that's involved with interacting with that audio CD uh, in a computer environment. Like maybe there's a menu, maybe there are images. So if you, sort, if you need to retain the whole CD, as it were, you can do something called uh, creating a disk image. And normally the ability to do this is, in, is included with, um, like I know you can do this with the disk utility in OS X. I'm pretty sure you can do this in a Linux environment. I'm not positive about Windows in terms of it having a sort of native utility to do this with, but there's, there's lots of programs out there that you can accomplish this with. And so what ends up happening is it creates uh, a block level, like a block for block image of all the data that's on that CD, and then um, that ends up as one single file on your computer. And then the computer operating system knows to interact with that file as if it were a CD. Um, but of course you've removed the data from the actual physical media. And then you can manage it as a, as a file in your computer uh, computer environment. Okay, so these tools here are geared towards uh, moving data off of hard drives. So most file systems have a built-in method to ensure that uh, data is actually copied correctly from one place to another. And if you're dragging and dropping a couple files from an external hard drive, to your accessioning or ingest computer, you're likely not going to result in corrupted or altered files, and it's pretty easy to check for that. But when you're transferring, say, a terabyte of data and thousands of files, uh, dragging and dropping becomes a little less reliable, and so you want an algorithmic way to actually check for the integrity of the file. And um, both of these use a checksum. If you're not familiar with this, a checksum is like a fingerprint for a file. It's an algorithm that you can run on a file or any piece of data, and it returns a string of, of values that is totally unique to that piece of data. So in other words, um, if that data changes just one bit and it changes, that checksum is going to change too. So the checksum is the way that you actually validate verify that two files are exactly the same or that a file has been copied correctly from one place to another. And so the one I use a lot on the right here is called rsync. It's really a command line tool, but it also has a number of graphical user interfaces that you can use, namely arsync for OS X, grsync for Linux, and cwrsync for Windows. And this program uses what's called a rolling checksum and basically it's creating a checksum on the data as it's um, being copied over. And when the data on the destination is being copied over, it doesn't appear to you as a file that you can see under normal circumstances. It's actually a hidden file and it has a temporary name. And so what's going on here is that rsync is copying the data over and it's verifying as it goes and it doesn't rename the file into its normal name until it has completely verified that all data has been moved over correctly and completely. And so this means that files don't end up on your destination as empty files, incomplete transfers, um, and you know with certainty that everything's made it over there uh, 100%. And if it doesn't, then of course, um, rsync will report that to you. Yes, yeah, so all of the tools that, I've, that I'm including here are actually freely available. So anything that I'm mentioning um, you can find online. And I've tried to include a link in the resources. Um, and I don't think I've included a link for rsync because there's so many uh, different GUIs that you can find and it's really system dependent that I'm, I'm going to 
I'm going to leave that up to um, all of you to, to figure that out. So let's talk about data accessioner for a second too. Um, this program does the same thing, but it uses a full file checksum. And basically what it's doing is on the source, it's uh, on this, like your hard drive, it's, it's calculating a checksum for each file. It's copying it over and then calculating a checksum on the destination. And then it compares the two. And um, so that's just a really, really basic way, but it's, it works very well. And the program will report to you if there's any unsuccessful transfers. The other thing that it does is that it um, extracts technical information about the process and about the files. So it'll extract, say, the MIME type or the file size or actually the actual checksum, and it'll include that as XML data that it um, outputs at the end of the process. Oh, just to get back to this question here, how big a difference do you see in the checksum values when there's only a one byte difference between two files? It's, it's really obvious. The checksums look completely different. Um, I can't really say um, how much different, but uh, it's, it's, it's obvious. Okay, this last slide here in the migration uh, section is, I won't get into too much because it's a very specific use case, but I just think it's so cool that I have to mention it. Um, this setup basically allows you to do non-real-time migration of DAT tapes. And it involves using uh, DDS drives, which are data tape drives that actually use DAT tapes. But DDS drives were never meant to read um, audio data from a DAT tape. They were only meant to be used as data. Um, but there were a couple drives that actually did have this feature. And some, uh, some people in the taper community out there, you know, these people that go to concerts and um, record live shows. And at the time when uh, DAT was a really popular format, these people were using DAT tapes to amass these huge libraries of DAT tapes. And so, of course, you know, like a decade later, they were all like, oh, what are we going to do now? Um, so some really adventurous people figured out how to make this work. And we have an, a working example of this at the archives here. And so we can just kind of crunch through our DAT tapes. It's, it works really well, but you, it's just really peculiar because you have to use Windows XP and a very specific uh, drive and even a specific firmware update on the drive. And so all of that information is included uh, in this link on the screen. It's also in the reference document. OK, let's talk about metadata for a second. We've migrated our data from their original carriers into a file-based format. And now we have to think about metadata. You know, we're used to talking about metadata in terms of types or categories of metadata. And there's some usefulness to doing this. But you know, in reality, these are not mutually exclusive categories. And so in terms of your workflow, I don't really want to talk about what this metadata is, per se. Um, I just want to talk about how you might collect it. I guess I'll talk a little bit about what it is. But, you know, in sum, administrative metadata helps a repository archive or manage their digital assets, right? So these are things like identifiers, information about when and by whom the digital object was created. And uh, Duke Data Accessioner, if you use that tool to migrate, will actually output that information for you in the XML. Uh, that it generates. And, you know, administrative metadata includes things like access and copyright and use restrictions. Um, let's see. And then uh, there's preservation metadata, which supports the ongoing effort to, um, you know, maintain your digital objects. And here we're basically concerned about uh, maintaining its fixity as, as one of the goals. And for this, we use checksums like we talked about earlier. And I'll talk about um, some other tools you can use here in a minute for generating checksums. And then, like I mentioned, for monitoring obsolescence, um, that's a really important function for preservation metadata. And the current practice is to kind of categorize your file by MIME type or media type. and this is actually 
um, a standard vocabulary, and um, there's a database maintained by the National Archives called PRONOM, which is P-R-O-N-O-M, and that um, is a source that Duke Data Accessioner actually uses to um, determine the MIME types of the, of the files that you are ingesting. And so that's, that's a very useful feature of Duke Data Accessioner. And as far as descriptive metadata goes, you know, this isn't really different for digital audio. Um, and technical metadata is something that we can say something very specific about uh, digital audio. Technical metadata really helps describe the sort of low-level characteristics of a file. And this is information that's necessary for reinterpreting the data in the future. I mean, you might not think about it now because most programs just work, you know, with this data. But in the future, there might be something unique about a certain file that you have that a, uh, you know, a program just doesn't know how to use that information. And so it's important to know, important to have that information recorded somewhere so you can actually look at it yourself. And um, we can extract this information automatically using a couple of programs. And the things that I think we should be most interested in are the, the MIME type, like I mentioned, the codec that was used, sample rate and bit depth, and bit rate if there's uh, compression used, and then the number of channels and potentially the creating application can be useful. And so in a minute I'll talk about uh, BWF meta edit and uh, media info and FF probe for ways of manipulating metadata. So first up is uh, BWF Meta Edit. With this tool, you can actually, not only can you view metadata, but you can actually manipulate it and change it. And this is specific to metadata that's in the broadcast WAV file uh, header. So it's only going to be broadcast WAV files that this program works with. And I should note that Steinberg's WaveLab program also lets you do this. And there may be other programs, like I think maybe Audacity lets you do this, but I'm not positive. Um, and then these other two programs that, I've, that I mentioned, Media Info or FF Probe, lets you extract metadata but not manipulate it. And so when you're extracting metadata, the idea here is, you know, you output it in XML or JavaScript object notation, and then through whatever means, um, you regularly use to transform data, like maybe XSLT, uh, you can then transform that data into your schema of choice and ingest it into your digital asset manager or database. So here's what uh, BWF meta edit looks like. Basically this is the You'll see on the interface, you can see tech and core as options to, to view metadata. And this is the, the technical metadata. So we're seeing things like bit rate, sample rate, duration, um, file size. And you'll also notice that BWF Meta Edit can generate a checksum and store it. Um, just to, a little note about this checksum, and that's under MD5 generated, MD5 stored. MD5 is a type of checksum. Um, this is actually only for the audio data. So it's not for the whole file. And this is useful because you could generate a checksum for the audio data only and then still manipulate the metadata in the broadcast wave header. And that won't actually change the value of the MD5 for the audio data. So that's, that's useful in some cases, but um, I think in most cases, most tools will not actually be able to um, verify or calculate checksums based upon the audio data only because they mostly deal with the full file. And under the core metadata, this is actually the BEXT chunk metadata. And so this, this program is very intuitive. It's just like editing, you know, using a spreadsheet or something. So it's uh, very easy to use. And uh, I just want to mention as well that we, 
in I, one of the earlier slides, there was the reference to the uh, FAGI guidelines for embedding metadata. That should sort of be your companion when you're using this tool, but um, the tool itself also provides a lot of information as you're using it. So like when you hover over um, the originator field, it tells you sort of how FAGI thinks you should use that. Um, but there's also another strategy uh, or other strategies out there for how you use it that differ from what FADGI thinks you should do. Um, for instance, in the Sound Directions project, which I mentioned earlier, I think, for the file naming um, recommendations, part of that documentation, part of, that, part of those recommendations include how you might embed metadata in the broadcast wave header. And I think one of their strategies was really ingenious. It includes actually putting in the file name into the description field of the BEXT header, or the BEXT chunk, and then also maybe you could include the original object ID. And the reason you might want to do this is because the file name isn't actually connected to the data of that file in any way. The file name is actually um, something that your computer's uh, file system, like the, the hard disk file system metadata is kind of owned by your computer and then the data is just on the disk. And so say your um, hard drive gets corrupted, some data recovery tools can actually go in and um, identify the beginnings and ends of files. And then some can even tell you what type of file it thinks it is. But there won't be any file names attached to it, because like I was saying, that's all included in the, in the file system metadata. So some people will say these files aren't self-describing, right? It can't tell you what its file name is, because that is file system metadata. Well, if you include the file name in the uh, BEXT description field, then you can actually view that data say, in its raw form with a hex editor, and then you can actually see the file name associated with the data. So that's just one method of actually recovering, um, you know, all of the hours of hard work you put into transferring something in the case that a uh, hard drive crashes. And um, I also want to mention that Kind of like your file name, embedded metadata shouldn't really be used to um, at the only place to store your metadata. In other words, it's not a replacement for external metadata. And um, I guess I just talked about these things here. So all right, we'll move on. OK, let's talk about some other tools you might use to extract metadata. So media info is uh, another free tool you can use. And basically what you're doing with Media Info is selecting a file, like you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen here, and uh, viewing, it can immediately extract that information and present it to you, but then you can also export it. Um, so like on the right-hand side of the screen, it's then transformed into just a very basic XML. And then you can transform that metadata yourself into whatever schema you prefer and then use it to ingest into a database uh, or a digital asset management system if you have one. But if you don't, I would say that using these tools is you know, still very useful because you can just export the data and save it as a text file. And um, you know, if you include that text file and it sort of travels around with your digital object, then you can always sort of view its metadata. And not to mention if you store your digital objects in, in offline storage like on tape, you know, that's a pretty resource intensive process to go and get that. So you could then just keep a local copy of the textual metadata on, you know, a hard disk and it takes up very little room and it can be very convenient to access. All right, finally on to access. Basically, um, 
there's a lot of different access paradigms and it's really going to depend on your institution what you choose to do you know you might be uh, providing online access you might only provide uh, in-person access but kind of what's common to all of these is that you don't provide access to your preservation files so you're going to be generating derivatives somehow and uh, there's really probably the way that you're going to do this is you're going to use whatever program you used to actually um, capture your digital audio. All of these programs will have the ability to export and um, encode the PCM data as either some sort of compressed or um, uh, losslessly encoded uh, file format. And there's a lot of advantages to doing that. So in most cases, you can uh, compress audio with, without a very noticeable um, loss in the quality of the content and the quality of the sound. And so your file sizes go down, it reduces your storage overhead and reduces the bandwidth requirements if you're providing online access. And uh, HTML5 has really been helpful in recent years for supporting online access to um, to media. It used to be that plugins were required to play any sort of media in a web browser, but that's not the case anymore. Um, but not all media is universally supported by all browsers. So currently MP3 uh, is the only file format that's, that you can play in any browser. So like I said, you could be using your nonlinear editors like WaveLab or Audacity um, to generate your derivatives, but there are other tools out there like Sox and uh, FFmpeg. And these are command line tools that um, I recommend because they can, they're really useful for batch encoding and for scheduling encoding. And I think it's really useful to actually uh, they push your encoding processes until like into the after work hours so that you're not consuming resources, your computer isn't sort of tied up generating derivatives while maybe you could be doing more migration. Um, and you know some of these, it's not just command line tools that will do batch processing, like I think WaveLab also does batch processing. And so that can be a really useful strategy for sort of increasing efficiency and sort of increasing throughput. But basically, no matter what program you use, you're going to have to specify um, what codec you're using. So if you're, for instance, using MP3, um, you're also going to have to specify what bit rate to use. And it can often be a question, you know, what's, what's the proper bit rate to use for access? Um, and I would just, I'm using 192 kilobytes per second as a, as a pretty good target because most people can't hear the difference between an MP3 encoded at 192 kilobytes per second and the uncompressed original. Some people may, but for the most part, uh, most people can't. And then there's another strategy you could use called var uh, variable bitrate encoding. And this process allocates more bits when there's sort of more complicated um, sound to encode. And then it uses fewer bits when it's less important, like say during, um, you know, when it's basically silent in the recording. And so that can achieve a smaller file size, but the same quality audio. Okay, the last thing we're gonna do in our workflow is set our future selves up for success by employing a few preservation strategies. And one of these might be normalization. Um, and this is the process of converting an audio file format. Uh, like you have a number of different audio file formats. You might normalize them all to one single format. And for instance, you may decide that you have a bunch of .vox files or real audio files. And um, you might think to yourself, those aren't going to be as long lived as our preservation file format, the broadcast wave file. So part of your preservation strategy could be to transcode all of those various audio files into a broadcast wave, which of course we have a lot more confidence in for long-term support. Um, and then one of the most important things you can do to aid in preservation efforts is generate a checksum as soon as you've created your preservation master file 
having this checksum will help you monitor data fixity over time, and it also provides a means of verifying that the processes that you're using are not inadvertently or accidentally corrupting your data. So it can also be a way to sort of monitor your processes. We noted before that when we talked about embedding metadata in a broadcast wave header that that can be also used to aid in preservation efforts in case there's a data failure or data corruption. So again, embedding original file names and source object identifiers can mean the difference between uh, recovering the data from a corrupt hard drive or, or losing it. And then finally, your method of storage will be one of the most important considerations for long-term preservation, but that's, um, that's another webinar. In fact, it's on October 20th. Uh, and, but the point about storage is this. If you have one copy of your information on a hard drive, it's not safe. And if you have a couple copies on different drives, it's a little bit safer, but still not that safe. Um, if you don't have any monitoring methods or a migration plan, then eventually that data will fall through the cracks. So the point is it must be actively managed. Um, it's really, I do recommend normalization, yeah. Um, it's, the question is which file formats to normalize. Um, and there are FADGI guidelines that actually can, can help you decide that. Basically, different file formats can be rated in terms of how well supported they are in the commercial industry or um, like how lossy is the data compression or, you know, there's all these considerations that go into exactly what file format is recommended. Um, but basically the concern is will software be able to play it back? And um, if, if you think that that software is going to fall by the wayside, which it typically typically will, unless it's something that's widely supported, like Broadcast Wave or MP3, then you wouldn't want to normalize to that format. You do want to normalize to Broadcast Wave because we know we'll support it. And you wouldn't want to normalize to MP3 because it's uh, compressed and you lose information during compression. So I hope that clears that up a little bit. Yes, when you embed metadata, it will change the checksum of the file. So um, you'll want to make sure that you do all of your embedding and then generate the checksum. Unless, of course, you're only using the broadcast wave meta edit checksum. So I know that's a little confusing, but that one does not change. But I think you can only validate it and generate it in BWF meta edit. So it's not really that interoperable. Um, yeah, I'm about done and I'll address those questions. Uh, and I do have an answer in mind, so. But first let's just talk about how to generate and monitor fixity, so generating checksums. Um, there's a couple tools that I recommend. One is uh, AV Preserves Fixity tool. This is really great for monitoring fixity over time, so long as the data is online, like on a hard drive, and it is accessible to the program. Um, and it can easily monitor many files in a directory, and it can actually send you a report as often as you want. And fixity is the process of <laughs> uh, monitoring the integrity of the data. So you would say that um, when I evaluate checksums to determine whether or not the data has changed, I'm monitoring fixity. Like the data should remain fixed. So the process of uh, inquiring as to whether or not it is fixed is monitoring fixity. That's my, <laughs> that's my dictionary definition, I guess. <laughs> um, so the other tool for monitoring fixity is, is called Bagger, or Bagit, and this was developed by the Library of Congress. And it's really useful for um, monitoring, let's say, files that you're going to transfer over um, an internet connection. So you can 
group a lot of files together and bag it up as uh, as it were and then you send it and then you can verify that all of those files that were sent together were um, uh, copied correctly so this is what um, the fixity tool looks like basically you can select on, on the left hand side you'll see that I've selected um, a directory that contains a number of files and scheduled the time for the program to run and then entered in my email address and so what will happen is the program evaluates the checksums of those files initially and then it goes back and it reevaluates them every time it's scheduled to run so it can tell you if the data has changed or not and then uh, the middle of the screen is this actual email that I received from the program and um, it tells you like oh there was a total of 18 files and they've all been confirmed which means none of them have become corrupted over time and then the detailed report is on the right and then with uh, bagger let's see you can again say select a directory of files and what bagger will do uh, is create a manifest for all of the files in the directory and then it calculates the checksum of, uh, for each of those files and then it also creates a checksum for the um, bagger data files so you'll see on the right hand side in the uh, second column there you see bag info dot text uh, bag it dot text and then the data file uh, the data folder actually contains the file that I'm wanting to monitor and then the rest is sort of uh, data about the bagger process so it can completely validate that not only has the uh, data that I'm wanting to monitor that has not changed but the bagger data has also not changed because that could also be a source of invalidating the data if your checksum changes from what it was supposed to have been then it'll no longer jive with your data so that could be a source of uh, of an error but bagger has ensured that it can um, totally validate your data and the data validation process itself can be validated so I think bagger is really more useful for packaging sets of files that you want to manage as digital objects or you just want to manage in aggregate because um, if you change anything about the internal data then that that bag will no longer validate with the bagger program so um, yeah like I said it's just better to manage all of that in aggregate so just finishing up here um, to do migration in-house in or do you outsource it um, well there are advantages to each and really um, I would say that if you have an ongoing need for migration because you want to provide on-demand access to your assets then it makes sense to have an in-house process for doing so it's also good to have direct control over the process so when it needs to change it can adapt to different needs and situations and you'll be able to monitor the process directly and it can even be easier to integrate migration with other services like repository or access services but the biggest downside of course is that it's really very resource intensive and um, not everyone has the resources requires a lot of labor and training and equipment maintenance um, if however you have a small collection of digital audio that you're trying to curate and no existing infrastructure then of course it makes sense to send your collection out to a vendor of course they already have the infrastructure and knowledge and they can also give you really concrete cost estimates for a given project and they'll likely get you know the job done faster than you would have and uh, sort of my best advice for working with vendors is that when you send uh, your your assets out you want to make sure that you have a very detailed inventory of what you're sending because of course you want to get them all back and you want to make sure that you um, get all of your derivatives produced so having a detailed inventory is very useful you should also have very clear instructions for file naming and how you want that done because there's no bigger pain than having to go and rename hundreds of files and then uh, you also want to clearly document the file formats and characteristics that you require for your deliverables 
And I think most importantly is to be sure that there's a time period built in to the process where you, where you actually have time to verify um, the quality of the work and verify that what you've received is what you actually asked for. Um, and AV Preserve has this tool that they've created called MDQC, which stands for Metadata Quality Control. And this can actually allow you to run tests against batches of files to make sure that the technical characteristics correspond to um, whatever you specified. But you can also use Media Info or FF Probe if you use FFmpeg to actually verify the technical characteristics of the files as well. Um, and beyond that, you should verify the content. Make sure that it sounds like it's supposed to. Spot check each file in three different places, mostly the beginning, the middle, and the end, to make sure that everything seems uh, like it should. And um, basically, you also just want to make sure that the file plays back, period. And uh, once you've verified your files, then of course you can uh, move those files into the rest of your curation process. Okay, that, that brings us to the end. I just want to mention the upcoming webinars in this series, and then there's a, a couple other series available too. Um, and thank you all very much for your attention, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity, and of course I welcome any questions with the remaining time. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. This is Kim. I've jumped back on the line here. Thank you all for participating. We do have um, just a few minutes remaining um, in our session today. So if you still have uh, questions, please feel free to add those to uh, the chat window and Alex can, can tackle those. Yeah, so regarding, um, is it really the case that you can use any interface? Um, I, I want to say theoretically yes, but I can sort of imagine a situation in which there's uh, an interface that was manufactured so cheaply that um, you shouldn't use it. But I mean, theoretically, yes, as long as it can transfer the data and you can verify that it's doing so correctly, then it really doesn't doesn't matter that much. I would say though that you should um, ask around and get recommendations from people. Okay, so I mentioned linear and nonlinear. Basically, any type of computer program where you're cutting, uh, so it allows you to manipulate audio or video. Um, this is called a nonlinear editor because you can sort of cut the audio, you can move regions around, you can organize it however you want. That's nonlinear editing. And that is in contrast to, say, editing a piece of audio tape, in which case you are taking a razor blade, you're slicing out a piece of tape and uh, removing it. That's that's linear editing. Does that clarify it? Yeah. So normalizing a large number of files. Um, I would. Yeah. Basically, you want to do that using some sort of batch process, and if your program that you're using for encoding your access files allows batch processing, then that's what you'll use. Um, it's really a question of, of whether that's available in the program that you have. But um, say uh, you're dealing with a large number of files and you're encoding those for access. If you also then encode those for normalization at the same time, um, then you're sort of killing two birds with one stone, so to speak. And I think the answer to that is no. Bagot really re relies on the structure that it generates when it creates a bag and the checksums that are contained in its manifest. So um, unfortunately, no, they won't, they won't work with that. I'm not, I'm not sure about fixity. Um, actually, I guess, yeah, Fixity won't work either because it, it stores the checksums internally instead, instead of producing so like an um, external file. Sorry, Alex, just to, to repeat the question um, uh, that you just answered there, it was in regard to, to Bagot and to Fixity. Uh, 
correct? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Just oh, wanted to make sure recommend... we get the question on here. Okay. Well, um, yeah, that's an example of <laughs> a cheap interface you shouldn't use. Um, but it's also maybe tough to say that it was the interface's problem. You know, there could have been other things on your computer that were interrupting the data stream uh, through the USB bus. Like perhaps you had many, many things connected via USB and that was interrupting the actual data stream. So I think, want to thank you so much, Alex, for uh, talking with us today. I know I learned a, a great deal. This was an incredibly informative session. Um, and this is the second part of our audio series. So for those of you who weren't able to participate in our session last week on Thursday, uh, Marcos's webinar will be available. Uh, for those who did not register for it already, we'll have information put out by the Association of Moving Image Archivist Office on how you might be able to purchase that webinar um, kind of as a standalone. So um, in the interest of time, I, unfortunately, we're going to need to wrap up here. Um, Alex, it looks like he's going to tackle a couple of uh, questions that are coming through via the chat box. Um, and then we will be sending you a link so that you can refer back to this session in the future, perhaps review it with your notes if any additional questions come up. And as Alex referenced in our session, in the Materials tab, uh, there is a wonderful PDF that he created with uh, resources and links to all of the uh, acronyms that we talked about and the website, so including all of the FAGI information, many of the tools put out by ABPS, and all of the other citations uh, to information he outlined. So um, on behalf of the EMEA Online Continuing Education Task Force, I want to thank you so much all for joining us again today. The recorded audio session is going to be available very soon to registered participants, so just keep an eye out in your inbox for that information. And uh, we will have our next session, uh, I think, let's see, go back here. Our next session for the introduction to digital format and storage will be on Wednesday, October 7th. Um, I want to thank the committee uh, the Education Committee, as well as the Online Continuing Education Task Force for chairing this and coming up with the idea to offer these sessions to the field. So thank you so much, Alex. Um, this was a real pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks all for being here. Great. So we'll look forward to um, hearing from many of you again in uh, a week and a half. Thanks so much. Take care. You're welcome. Thank you.